Welcome to Mike Morrison Ministries Church at the Barn Tuesday night Bible study. All right, let's let's pray. Father in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. It is incorruptible seed that grows in our hearts. And I thank you that as we put it in our spirit, it goes through our mind to get there and it renews our mind on the way in and it changes our mind on the way it comes out back on our tongue. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you uh, open your Bibles, please? Uh, let me get my notes. I had, I had everything all arranged, and then I unarranged it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. The spirit of confusion is out of this place right now in the name of Jesus. Take authority over anything trying to stop a plain presentation of these basic truths in Jesus' name. We are studying basics, basics of faith. And uh, as usual on Tuesday night, it seems like God wants one lesson to lead to another lesson to lead to another lesson. So if it sounds like I'm jumping in the middle of something here, or if you're interested in, you pick this up and you're interested in more, sometimes if you back up to the lesson last week, it uh, ties in with the lesson this week. But rather than teach last week all over again, I'll just, I just want to remind us of the points we ended with. There were five uh, procedures, I guess you could say, basics, for a believer to live by every day. And uh, number one is to get full of the Word of God. You need to spend it every day in the Word and, and uh, soak it in. By hearing the Word preached, by reading the Word for yourself, for context, by studying the Word, um, sometimes you can read um, a chapter, read the same chapter over again for a few days. Sometimes you can read the same book over again four or five times, letter, epistle. Sometimes you can just read the whole New Testament as fast as you can in a few days. Fast some television, and news media, bad weather reports, and read the Bible, as, read the New Testament as fast as you can just for context. Um, there's a lot of ways to get the word in you, but number one, get get full, and then number two, stay full, because it, once you get the word in there and you and you're doing what God told you to do, the word's coming out of you all the time. You're putting faith, faith cometh by hearing the word, and the, and the faith comes in, and then as you pray and you do what God's told you to do, and you're walking with Him, and you're and you're doing what He's assigning you to do. Everything the Word brought in there is being directed by your words in different directions, so you have to stay full. You have to keep... You don't ever want to take days off from filling yourself with the Word of God. And too many Christians only get fed when they go to church, and they don't go to church if anything else comes up. <laughs> and therefore, um, they're a bit on life support spiritually because their spiritual food is so low, their spirit's real skinny, and then they spend so much time with information coming from the world, uh, uh, watching uh, all the different things we have on our devices now to keep up with everything that's going on every second of every day, that the intellect and the mind gets completely stuffed full. So, you, so that if you could see these see people in the spirit, they have these little skinny bodies and these great big heads. <laughs> this filling the brain up at the expense of starving the spirit is a real bad idea and it's a good way to get clobbered 
in this world and wonder, why did God let that happen to me? Why, did, why does bad things happen to good people? Because they don't get full, they don't stay full. If they, are, if they do get full, they don't stay full. And then number three, once you're full and you're staying full, you take a stand, release that faith and start fighting. And number four, once you start fighting, you keep fighting and you don't ever let up. Don't base what you're doing on results based on do what you're doing on what God told you to do and just keep doing what he told you to do because he said to do it. And ha having done all to stand, stand is the way the Bible says it in Ephesians chapter 6. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Just keep doing the right thing because it's right. I think so too often Christian people get to watching that fruit watching for results, wanting something. Uh, and, and our job isn't growing fruit. Our job's planting seed. God grows the fruit. Our job's to plant the seed, and our job's to pick it, harvest it. But everything between the time we sow it and the time we harvest it is God. He's got the big job, and we've got to say that with me. We, he's got the big job. I've got a little job. That's why my burden's light. And my yoke isn't heavy. That's why, because God gave us, God gave us a key part. Our, our part is key. But, our, but he's got the law. He's got, he's got it as long as we initiate it. So that's to my point this week. Here we get to the ifs. I want to, I want to look at uh, six hats of the believer and four ifs. The Bible said in <coughs> six hats. Sometimes in this life, uh, I, anybody that's been in business would know. Uh, sometimes you have to hear, you have to wear one hat for a while that day, and then you have to take that hat off and put on another hat and do another job for a while that day, and then you take it, this hat off and put on another hat and. Uh, it require different things that come up throughout the course of a day can require different skills. Spiritually, I believe that God has assigned us six hats to wear. And uh, th these are all basics, basics of faith, not any of these that you probably don't know already. But if we don't remind ourselves of these basics, we're using them all the time. And if we won't go back and look and remind ourselves and refill on this stuff, we'll drop, drop part of it. Quit wearing one of those hats. You don't have the right hat on at the right time and wonder, what happened? How'd that happen? That shouldn't have happened. That wouldn't have happened if you'd had the right hat on. Hats. Second uh, Corinthians 5.20 says we're ambassadors for Christ. That means we represent Christ. Let's read this. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. So now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. You know what? I think I'm going to back up here in... Uh, and get the context of this. If we don't get through six hats and four ifs, which we will, but if we don't, we'll just keep going next week. Uh, let's start in, uh, this is very, very basic, but we don't want to leave something out here, so let's start in verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. 
the Amplified Bible there, the Amplified Classic, says a new creature altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. But all things are from God who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, received us into favor, brought us into harmony with himself, and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. By, uh, that by word and deed, we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. So there's the two, uh, the two number one assignments for every Christian in this planet right now. If you've ever said, I don't know what God's called me to do, yeah, you do. It tells you right here. It's two things. Pray and evangelize. Tell people about Jesus and, and lead them to the Lord. And intercede and pray and believe God. Get your faith out there and believe God. Now verse, uh, he gave to us the ministry of reconciliation that by word and deed we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. It was God, personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation, of the restoration to favor. If you ask people who do not know Jesus, they've never been born again, Ask them if God's mad at them, and every one of them, if you've got them alone, and they're paying attention, and, they're, and they're, they want you to know. I mean, if you've asked them a question, they want to answer that question. They'll all say the same thing. Yes, he is. There's a, lo there's a lot of uh, people think that they're beyond, God won't have anything to do with them. He's mad at them. Where do they get that? Where do people get the idea that God's mad at? Them? From Christians. That's where they get the idea. You're a sinner. God hates sin. Therefore, God hates sinners. And that, that's not true. God loves sinners. It's true he hates sin. And he hates the agent of it. He hates the devil. God sits in heaven and laughs at the devil, but he loves people. So what we need to do is get that message across right there, C canceling, not committing, not committing to us the message of reconciliation, the restoration to favor. Let me read that. Makes sense. Verse 19, it was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation, of the restoration to favor. We have to let these people know Jesus took that sin problem out of the way. Now receive what he did for you. Thank him for it and call him the Lord of your life. Take advantage of what God freely gave you. He's given it, but you, he, he doesn't get anything back until you take it. Have you ever tried to give somebody something and they wouldn't, they wouldn't receive it? It's not any fun. I mean, you didn't get it for them because you didn't want them to take it. Oh, that's too much. That's just too much. I can't take that. I don't think you see that as much in this gimme, gimme, gimme generation as we did a few years ago. But um, I, I, I know that when Sherry and I were first married, uh, uh, Sherry, we had some debt and we had some counsel from some people who will remain nameless that we should go to the government and get this the government had money here and the government had money there and I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I was raised, you don't, you don't go to handouts, you don't look for handouts, especially from the government. And nowadays, that's the first place 
everybody runs to, you know, that's that free money. Free money. It wasn't always like that, but the point is, uh, we have, as Christians, a different way of living. We have uh, an entirely different, uh, I wrote it down here a certain way. Le here it is. Living by faith in a world that lives by sight. Jerry Seville called that uh, paddling upstream in a canoe when the whole world's going downstream in a motorboat. It's, it's not, this life of faith isn't the easiest thing to learn how to do, but if you ever get over there in it, and you turn loose of the world's way of doing things, and you get over in the God way of doing things, and it starts, you start to see how this, you start to see that God's plan, although it doesn't make common, it doesn't meet common sense all the time, it has supernatural power in it. That paddling, paddling that canoe, that'll turn into a bass boat with a big motor on it and you'll be headed right where God tells you to go whether the whole world's coming this way at you or not. You go right up through the middle of them. Yeah. Wide open. Hallelujah. So, living by faith in a world that lives by sight requires two things of every believer you have to decide. It requires a decision of quality. You have to decide to set your will, your willpower, to stay in the word. I'm going to do it. In the name of Jesus, with your help, Lord, I'm not going to put the Bible down. I'm going to stay in it every day. I remember the day I made that decision and I remember what my life was like up until that point and I remember what it was like after that. Let me, sh I can't, I guess we're videoing, I can show you. <laughs> my life was like this. It was like a, like a bad rodeo and it wasn't getting better. And I and had found the faith message and I had found out uh, how good God was, and I had found out how to believe God, and I'd see things going really, really good. In fact, they'd go so good that I'd just start goofing around again, and then they'd start going bad again. And then I'd start doing the right thing again, and go, start going right again. And this went on for, I don't know, a couple years. Maybe, maybe longer than that, but it, <clears throat> one day, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never forget uh, I'll never forget that day. And I, when God spoke to me that day, it wasn't all that nice. It was very, very strict, very stern, and very, very firm, and very much louder than it sounded to me like he's <coughs> chewed me out pretty good. And uh, I just, and I committed that day to stay in the word this time. When, it, when, I, when everything started going right, and I knew it would because I'd seen it happen before, I'd stay in the word anyway. And then what happened? There were still ups and downs in life. There are to this day. But you just keep going up. It's up and down, but the trend is up. And every year the trend is up. And it just gets, it, the longer you live, the, the easier it is to hear his voice. The more, the more he asks you to do, the more, uh, the more devils you come up against and the more victories you see. It's a, it's a fight, right, till you leave this planet. But winning gets to be, you know, winning, victory's addictive. <laughs> it's, it's, it is fun to get in on something where, some, where Almighty God always causes you to triumph. Every single, where you never lose. Bat a thousand. That's fun. And if there's a place in your life where you haven't seen that victory, 
just say, I've seen it. Yeah, it's mine. I've already got it. God promised it to me. It's mine. I can see it. It's not, <laughs> here's how the Bible put it, hope that manifests, that's not hope. Why isn't it hope? It manifests. Hope is expecting something, it's looking for something that hasn't happened yet. When faith brings that hope to pass, uh, you don't need hope for that anymore. But, as, but real Bible hope, you've already, you've, you have it before you have, it's not tangible yet, but you have it. In the invisible, you have it. And then when you have it in the invisible, it will manifest in the visible. It has to manifest in the visible. God always causes us to triumph in Christ. You just have to get it in the invisible first. And uh, hallelujah, living that way requires a decision of quality. You have to set your will to skid in the Word and stay in the Word, and you have to decide, I'm going to live like that, but you can't do it with willpower. You get started with the willpower. You have to set your will. But the second thing is you need the supernatural anointing power of the Holy Spirit of God to manifest and make this work. You need help. I need help. Every human being needs help, and thank God he sent us the helper. The Greek word for Holy Spirit, uh, paraclete. It takes seven English words to get it across. Comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener. Stand by. That's who lives on the inside of the born-again believer. And he, he has supernatural ability. He's Almighty God. In all these areas, he is, he is in us so that if we need comfort, we've got it. If we need counsel, we've got God counsel. That's why you don't want to you don't want to mix Old Testament prophets job up with the New Testament prophets job because in the Old Testament people did not have the Holy Spirit in them. In the New Testament you have the spirit of God on the inside of you. So a New Testament prophet is is prophesying things that should be registering on the inside of you and if they're not don't get over there and get all confused. Go in here and get straightened out. Hallelujah. He'll bring it together. How many of you have ever been a little bit confused about something? <laughs> that area that, that, you know, from the time you get a glimmer until you see the light, is the, it's the Holy Spirit's the helper the intercessor, the advocate, strengthener, stand. He's the one that leads you. He leads you right through that um, where you don't see clearly. You see, you see through a glass darkly is where the old English translated Paul. I see through a glass darkly. It's a little, it's a little fuzzy, out of focus. Out of focus yeah, but the Spirit of God's job on the inside of you, and He just good at it, and he wants to do it for everybody all the time, is to bring that clear. But how does that happen? Well, you've got to spend time in a word. I don't know. I've got half my notes on the back side of this page, and half you have to get full, stay full, take, take a stand, keep standing, and then the fifth one, if we didn't get to it tonight, to repeat. Get full, stay full, take a stand, keep standing, repeat. Get full, stay full, keep full, keep standing, repeat. You learn how to do this after a while, you might have, you know, 35, 40, 50 things you're standing on all at the same time. It, for most of us, it requires a prayer book just to keep track of what you're believing God for. 
It's good to have a prayer book and keep track because when you don't, it looks like, well, I'm not getting any prayers answered. But when you have one, you'll see, oh, he answered that, and 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 he answered that. And in, in your mind, all you'll see is the ones that he didn't answer. So keep keeping a book, good idea. And besides that, there's different kinds of prayer in uh, some kinds of prayer petition, you really don't need to pray more than once. Bring it before God, write it out, bring it before God, pray it, and stand on that prayer and believe in God that when you pray, believe you receive it and you have it, and then just keep that prayer there and just praise God every time you think about it. You can go over that prayer and just say, thank you, God, this, this, I have this. I, I ask you. And you gave me this. It's mine, and I thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Anytime that you're wondering about it, just praise him and thank him for it again. Keep your, keep your mind, your willpower lined up where the Holy Spirit set, your, set you. You're a spirit. He's in here. Stay hooked up to that. Hallelujah. All right, so back to the, back to the six hats. 2 Corinthians 5.20, we finally got to. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. You are ambassadors for Christ. Say this, I am an ambassador for Christ. Amen. Now that's every believer. You, you don't have to repeat. <laughs> that's every, every believer... There are some things that are unique to what God called you to do, but there are a lot of things that God called every single one of us to, and this is one of them. And the things that God told, called every one of us to are vital. They're not something that you want to learn about someday. These are basics you want to move to the front of the line and you want to keep in the front of your thinking all of the time. I represent Almighty God in the earth. It's my assignment. And it doesn't matter if you just got born again last week. You're an ambassador for Christ. You now represent heaven and the earth. You have a new country. You might have citizenship in the United States of America, but you have a citizenship that's more important than that now. You're a citizen of the kingdom of Almighty God. Your home is in heaven. You represent heaven and earth. And this is a secondary citizenship here now. And now you can take the privileges you have in heaven and get something done in this country with that that you couldn't do before you were connected to the Holy Spirit and the power of Almighty God and the word, the covenant he gave you in his blood, his promises that he promised to do for you in this country because you belong to that country. You're an ambassador representing heaven in this earth. Wherever you step is sovereign soul of the kingdom of Almighty God. As sure as an ambassador representing the United States of America in a foreign country has an embassy, that he lives in. Where you abide is your embassy, and not only that, wherever you go, you're taking the kingdom with you. Wherever you step is sovereign soul of the kingdom of Almighty God. You and I can, you and I can take authority over things that are wrong in the earth. Just You don't even have to physically be there to do it, but it, it helps to physically... Get out, to physically know it helps your faith to get out, get out and pray over so something wrong. Get out there and get out there and get in the middle of that. I, I remember a testimony I heard when I was first learning about faith of a cotton farmer that uh, got onto this, and that cotton in Texas, when they have a crop, they make a lot of money. They don't get a crop every year. In fact, it averages, I think, the, I think it averages a crop every four years. 
and they never know when that's coming, and it's not every four years on time. You know, sometimes they get two in a row, and sometimes they go a long time without, but they every year they have to plant. Well, this his uh, cotton come up, and there wasn't nothing happening, and he'd run out of time. He was run out of money, and he had he had tithe, he had given offerings, he was believing God, and he was desperate. And he walked out in that cotton field and he said, God, I have a covenant with you. I know that I, I know I have a covenant with you. I know you told me to plant this crop. I know that you made it, I know you made this property available to me. I know I did what you told me to do. And in the name of Jesus, I need cotton. And he's, while, he was, while he was releasing his faith, and standing on its covenant with Almighty God, the, the cotton balls started popping on that cotton. And this is not the way cotton works. And it started pop, pop, pop. But look, he said it looked like popcorn. Just the whole, the, whole, the whole field busted out in cotton right before his eyes. And it was the biggest crop he ever had. I used to remember that guy's name. But I can't remember it right now. Um, and this was back in the 70s when this message of faith wasn't uh, something that a lot of people had got all into yet. <laughs> it was, uh, there was a time in the United States when preaching what I'm preaching right now would get you run out of just about every, um, every church there was in America. In fact, the guys that were preaching this kind of stuff in the 70s usually had to rent buildings outside churches to do it because the church wouldn't have anything to do with this message. Believe in God is not what religion wants to do. Religion wants to beg God to do things. Religion's very tangled up with the Old Covenant and the Old Testament and the Law of Moses, and they've got it all mixed together, and they've got this thing or all in their pat, in their thinking, the way they like it, except it doesn't work. It won't get you any cotton. <laughs> and it wasn't popular in the 70s to believe that God would get you money. It wasn't popular. Uh, John G. Lake went into the, to uh, Africa during the bubonic plague, he knew how to believe God to the point where uh, God put him in Africa to take care of that plague. What he preached and the, the word of God on the subjects, what turned that around and drove that curse out of that entire continent. But at the same time, he left because he didn't have any money. He didn't know anything about prosperity. He didn't know, he didn't know that God would finance you. Why didn't people know that? Nobody taught it. it. There was no revelation of it. And then when there began to get a revelation of it and somebody started teaching it, they called it the blab it and grab it bunch. All oh, they want your money. And uh, that went on for, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years. The, the religious organizations would fight against that. And... Uh, but finally, praise God, the, the uh, truth got out. And in uh, the, these ministries that knew how to believe God for money were getting down on television and buying airtime that uh, the people that, that didn't believe in prosperity couldn't get the money to get on. Television's expensive, and it doesn't carry itself. Everybody thinks these big shot TV evangelists, you know, they got all that money because they're on television. Uh uh uh, no, 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 no. That's not it. That television costs big money and it hardly ever pays. They're out there because they want the Word of God spread around the world and that's the fastest way to get it there. Hallelujah. Finance, uh, the way finances come is by finding out what God said and following His directions. Hallelujah. But I don't want to get too sidetracked here. I want to keep on track. Ambassadors. 1 Peter 2, chapter 5. 
but First Peter chap, First Peter chapter two, verse five, and verse nine. And I then once again, these are very basic, but they are vital. Got to fill back up on it every so often. First Peter chapter two, verse five. Ye also, as a lively stones, are built up a spiritual household and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. I think I'll read the Amplified Bible. The Old English is uh, just a little bit confusing. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Amplified Classic. Come and like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house for a holy, dedicated, consecrated priesthood to offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's who you are in Christ Jesus. Say that way. That's who I am in Christ Jesus, a priest. What a priest does is you represent Almighty God to the people, And you represent people to Almighty God. You intercede for people on behalf of people to God, and you represent God to the people. Now, of course, that would be to to, uh, believers who don't know about that yet, but it's also to the world that doesn't have anything to do with God. It's evangelism again. Our job is to pray everybody, every believer, Pray and evangelize. Pray and tell people about Jesus. Tell them how good he is because they don't know that. And when they finally see how good he is, show them how to come into the kingdom with you. And that don't, you don't have to show people how to go to church. You have to show people who Jesus is and how to receive him as Lord. You know when people want to come to church? When the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of them says, come here. You need to get in here. And Until people can hear God tell them. You, I mean, you can tell, you can make people go to church. But <laughs> you're not going to you can't make them want God. It's impossible. But you can intercede for them, and you can, you can tell them whatever it is God tells you to say. You know what God will tell you to say sometimes? Nothing. <laughs> have you ever heard God tell you to keep your mouth shut? I know a lot of people that if they have ever heard God tell them to keep their mouth shut, they're not very good at it. I have heard Christians given some counsel that I'm thinking shut them up God just shut them up they they don't know when to shut up there is a limit to how much you can stuff in a bird's mouth without choking a bird did you know that (laughs) it's a there's a, there's a concept in the New Testament people need to get a hear, hold of. God's talking all the time. And he said that we can, we can hear him. So the concept is we need, to li- we need to learn how to listen, and then we need to learn how to do what he says. And if he says shut up, we need to learn how to zip it. And if he says, say something, you know, there are some strong silent types that just don't ever want to say anything. 
sometimes, sometimes that person needs to learn how to speak up. And there are other personality types that just need to learn how to, whoa, whoa, whoa. Calm her down there, seven notches. Red Rider. <laughs> Be, uh, priests represent God to the people. You don't just you don't just say you know just just go to the people and tell the people what to do and then go to God and say, How'd I do? That's not what a priest. A priest has got a hot wire to God, and you just you just you just hear God and say what He tells you to say. And if he's, if there's nothing there to say, it might be time to listen. Because priests, to to be a priest and represent people to God, you have to hear what they have to say. You don't have to hear them run off in unbelief, but but you do have to understand. What, they, what it is they need. You have to listen for a minute. Have you ever heard anybody tell you their problem and then start over on the problem and then start over on the problem? That's probably not a very good idea. I'll tell you why. You don't want to let people do that. The problem's big enough already. If you speak to the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and not doubt in your heart, believe those things you say will come to pass, you'll have what you say. But if you keep talking about the mountain all the time, you keep building the mountain bigger, you're not tearing it down, you're making it bigger. So sometimes you'll hear God as a, as a priest representing God in the New Testament. You'll hear God say, uh, stop them. Got to interrupt that. Got to woe that down and say, okay, that's the problem. Now let me tell you about the answer. His name's Jesus, and he has the want to, and he has the power to turn that problem into a victory. He'll turn it around for you. Here's how he'll do it. Let's pray. You know, just get, get, the, get them looking at Jesus. They're looking at the problem. They need to look at Jesus. It's just that simple. You're a priest that represents Jesus to people that need him. You have to get their mind off their problem and get their mind on the answer. And how do I do that? You'll know when the time comes because the Holy Spirit in you will show you all, everybody that has the need is unique. And there might be this way to get to this guy and this way to get to that lady and this way to get to that child. It might be unique since each one of them is unique, the way that God has you get through to them so that they can see him might be unique, probably will be. It's an adventure. This is fun. You should say, yeah! Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> All right. Uh, Let's look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Verse uh, 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord has saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, <clears throat> he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto the judgment of that great day, unto darkness, unto the judgment of that great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going on. What am I doing? I'm not... I'm thinking, where, where's the point here? I'm in Jude. Revelation. That was so, what, whoa, that's really good, but that, that is not what I'm trying to do here. <laughs> Revelation 1, 6, 5, 5, 1, 4. John to the seven churches in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. Who's that? He was, he is, and he is to come. Same yesterday, today, and Jesus. 
and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the grace of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Say, he has made me a king and priest. We already talked about being a priest. What does a king do? They sit on a throne and they rule. They make decisions of life and death. And they set the scepter, so be it. Do you know what amen mean? So be it. You and I are set here by God in the earth as an ambassador representing heaven, as a priest representing people to God and representing God to people, and you are here as a king with a scepter to to, uh, judge sin, not sinners, sin. Don't judge people and call them sinners. Judge what they're doing If it's wrong, call it wrong. If it's right, call it right. We are not here to be the silent majority. The devil tried to talk us into that, and he did a pretty good job of talking the church into being silent for a long time. It was just not fair for uh, the major, by far majority of the United States of America to say anything about the evil going on in their country. That's not fair. I mean, these evil people have a voice, too. That's what the world says. You can't, you, you can't have an opinion. You're the majority. It's not fair. You had everything given to you. They're, uh, they're, un, they're not privileged like you. No, they're not blessed. There's no blessing on what they're doing. The curse is working. That's what the problem is. It's got nothing to do with anything except good and evil. But if somebody doesn't speak up, people will start believing that slop that's being slung as truth. That's, <laughs> it happened. Our whole nation is believing a lie is truth, and truths are lies. <clears throat> Morality is very, very important to the future of this nation. And yet, this government has, and this, the way the government promotes things, and the way people love money, you would think that our economy is the most important thing that's going on in this world. And I'm telling you what, the economy of the United States of America is a mess because the morals are a mess. You turn around the morals and the economy will take care of itself. Almighty God will fix the economy. It isn't the economy that's number one in this country. It isn't the armed forces even. It is what is number one in this country is morals. And until we start calling right right instead of wrong right, and we start calling wrong wrong instead of right wrong, we're going to continue to slide. We, to turn this thing around requires people speaking up in love not arguing and fighting but just saying you know what that's wrong and as for me and my house we'll serve the lord and you'll not tell me not to and have me bow the knee because i will not bow the knee to evil in the name of jesus i will not bow to evil in the name of jesus and tell the church Man's up in love, in agape love, and quits being who the world says we are. We won't see the revival that God's bringing. Now, let me put this in perspective. There are, we are seeing it because there are people doing this right. Amen. And we're in on it. Hallelujah. It's turning. But in order to turn it faster, 
we need to uh, look at it, these basics. The, the morality is a basic part of the Christian life. Morality is vital to the Christian life, and morality is vital to a Christian nation, and we have to start putting it in the forefront of what needs to happen instead of giving it a back seat. Well, you know, there's worse things than living together outside of marriage. No, there aren't. It's just as bad as the other things that people think are worse. It's opening doors and allowing the devil into families, into, into cities, into states, and into our nation that shouldn't be, those doors should not be open, and our lending our okay to something that's not okay isn't turning things around, it's making it worse. Adultery is wrong. Fornication is wrong. Living together, having sex outside of marriage is ungodly. It's wrong. There's not anything about that that should be accepted. And yet Christian people, Christian people, are telling their kids, you don't need, don't get married. You're making a mistake. If they're living together, they're making a mistake. They better get married. That's such horrible counsel. I can't imagine where we ever went wrong enough in the church to counsel kids not to get married when they're sleeping together. It's ruining the family. It, it, it's right straight from hell, and Christian people are falling for it, hook, line, and sinker. It's ridiculous. When you look at it from God light and Bible light, it's just stupid. <laughs> How did we slip that far that fast? <laughs> I hope that wasn't too blunt. And I, you know, I probably could have took another example that didn't step on so many toes all at the same time, but I'm telling you, church, if we don't start saying, you know, the king doesn't have any clothes on, yeah. and we keep playing with this stupidity, we're going to keep getting bad results. We've got to turn this thing around somewhere. And if somebody, sooner or later, has to tell the truth. That's right, and that's wrong. And we've got to quit calling wrong right, and we've got to quit calling right wrong. We can't keep doing that and have the blessing drive the curse out of this nation. But, the good news. If we'll quit doing that and start calling right, right, and wrong, wrong, then God turned this thing around. It's the morality that, the, that we're here to vote for. When you vote, don't think that this economy is the number one thing. Don't think our... Uh, don't let any issue, and there are lots of issues, don't let any of them get above morality. <clears throat> That's the key. That's where the church needs to stand up, man up, and, and do the right thing. Adultery is wrong. Fornication is wrong. Uh, mar marriage is one man to one woman at a time. Duh. And anything deviating from that is wrong. It's immoral. It's ungodly. It's not scriptural. And it's not good for this nation. And we've got to say, we've got to call it wrong. We can't say, well, you know, we understand. It's okay. No, it's not okay. The people are... I, I'm not saying the people aren't okay. I'm saying what they're doing, that's not okay, and we can't legalize something that's not okay. And we can't lend our approval to it. Well, the law is the law. We fought a war over tea <laughs> because it was wrong. 
And now we're going to say something that's truly evil isn't worth fighting for? you got to be kidding. Oh, no. I'm going to mark my page right here. I've got three out of six hats and the four ifs I haven't scratched yet. Well, we're getting there. We'll just pick right up here when we come back. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for uh, this opportunity that we have uh, living on the planet right now, 2013. I thank you for what's going on in the, in the nation, the United States of America. I thank you for the North American continent, what's going on here. I thank you for the entire world and the light that's beginning to shine and turn darkness around so that we can have a harvest. You're binding the tares and you're going to harvest the wheat and we get to be in on it. And I thank you for the privilege. I thank you for showing us how to be priests and kings right in the middle of this giant worldwide harvest revival, renewal and revival in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen.